are live for another story time with Buck Buck. And I promised you that I need to move my ashtray. Sorry, give me a second. I promised you last week that this week's would be a doozy and I aim to deliver and I think I've succeeded in this one. Obviously, the legalities before we begin. Yeah, I'm going to watch out the morn. A minimum. Right, so, I must remind you, particularly this story, it's not for anyone under the age of 18 and not suitable for those with a nervous disposition. Why I still need to read this off a sheet of paper is beyond me because I say it weekly. Hi, how are you? I am very well, thank you very much. Wraith, my dear, how are you? Um, I'm brand new in the channel. If you're looking for any previous episodes, check out my YouTube channel. You'll find them all there. I upload every Tuesday because Twitch have got a thing where you've got to Wait 24 hours before sharing your content after you've signed the affiliate agreement. <laughs> so, every Tuesday, I'll upload to that. If you're watching it on... If you're watching this on YouTube later on, thank you. Please, please, please hit the sub, ring the bell, so that you know whenever I upload. Every sub, every notification, every follow goes to support me and lets me continue doing this and this is what I love doing. This and video games. But it's Sunday so we're not here to talk about video games. But without further ado, hope you've got the hankies at the ready's folks. Let's get on with tonight's story. It's rough at my cigarette. And see, I'm learning from my mistakes. I'm not on the roll up tonight. I bought tips eggs earlier. Because it takes me about 20 minutes to get through one cigarette and I'm rolling them. And that ashtray sucks. <laughs> right. So, so far in this series, we've covered some of the worst murders that history has to offer. Met some monsters that, quite frankly, would make Ryan Murphy proud of creating. Hey legit, yeah, today's been good, thanks. Went over to the in-laws, had a spot of dinner, a mad dash to the supermarket to get some printer ink. I've had some serious issues with the old printer this week, but I, I got there, eventually. And I'm settled down to, I know, it, it's a shark mug, okay. The baby shark thing's stuck. It's actually many me that got with us, so... I'm actually drinking the whiskey tonight. That's how bad this story is, folks. But, like I said in my post the other day, they're my fucking adults. If I want to drink, I will drink. <laughs> but, yeah. Like I said, some of the murderers and monsters we've met, not. including him, not legit, yes, we met Jack the Ripper two weeks not ago. But yeah, Ryan Murphy couldn't write this shit. And the reason I'm using Ryan Murphy as a reference, I've just started watching the latest season of American Horror Story. Um, if you're into horror, I thoroughly recommend it. And Evan Peters is back, and everybody loves Evan Peters. He's just brilliant in the broken back, and I'm so happy. And Macaulay Culkin's in it. Oh, weird. <laughs> Never would have saw that coming, but hell. But the monsters that we have read about, that we have learned about over the last few months here, they're not make believe. They're real. They really did exist. Unfortunately, some of them still exist today. Which leads me to tonight's story. Now, I've never had the fact that under the right circumstances, 
Now that is important. Under the right circumstances, I believe that the death penalty should be put to use. I've never had that. I've made that clear, especially with the Manhattan Ripper last week. I believe that he... Sh I still believe that he should not be in prison. He should have been sentenced to death. But... What happens when the justice system gets it wrong? And believe me, they do get it wrong sometimes. Tonight's story, we will learn about three people who were sentenced to death in three different centuries and all for the crime of murder. Hannah, oh, I, I apologise in advance for the pronunciation, so please bear with me. I have a speech impediment and some of these names are rather difficult for normal speaking people to pronounce, so I apologise in advance if I butcher them. So, Hannah Okrish arrested for the murder of six-year-old Eunice Bolas on July 21st, 1786 and was arrested the same day. Found guilty, sentenced to death by hanging. Sentence carried out December 20th, 1786. Eighty-six. James Arsene arrested for robbery and the murder of Swedish immigrant Michael, uh, sorry, no, William Fiegel. The murder was committed on the November 25th. Oh, hey, cat. Hey, legit, the real cat just walked in. <laughs> November 25th, 1872. And he was arrested, found guilty, and sentenced to death. Twisting the story with him, he escaped, but I'll get to that. He was, however, rearrested 12 years later, and sentence was carried out on June 18th, 1885. Why does that say James? His name wasn't James. George Junius Stinney Jr. Arrested for the murder of 11-year-old Betty June Bickener and 8-year-old Mary Emma Thames. Hey, Kia. How's you? On March 25th, 1944, arrested the next day, found guilty and sentenced to death by electrocution, carried out June 16th, 1944. <coughs> so, three different killers over three different centuries. What could possibly connect them, right? My camera's out of focus. I apologise, give me two seconds to fix this. There we go. I don't know what happened there. Saying that, I got my new Ethernet cable, then that's probably just been knocked down. So, yeah. Three killers, three centuries. What could possibly connect them? I should point out that they were all in America. Okay, just for the record, hence the death penalty. But, yeah, all three murders were committed in America. But over three different centuries, 1700s, 1800s, and 1900s. Seemingly nothing connects them, except for the small fact that all three killers were only children when the crimes were committed, and they were all sentenced to death as children. Two of whom were actually children when their sentences were carried out. Bearing in mind our second killer, James Arsene, eluded justice. He was able to escape after his trial 
and went on the run. So he was an adult by the time they caught up with him and sentence was carried out. But the other two were children when the sentences were carried out. So... Now that's bad, right? That is pretty bad. We have child killers being sentenced to death. And unfortunately, that's not the worst part of tonight's story. So stay tuned, because there is a twist at the end of this one. And it, it's heartbreaking, I'll be honest, that it really is. So, I'll go in chronological order, oldest to newest, because obviously, historical reasons, along the course, laws change and things like that, so it's easier just starting with the first murder in the 1700s and moving to present day. Hannah, sorry, Hannah Ockerish is described as being mentally retarded, FYI, I fucking hate that term, but that is a direct quote, okay? That is how this little girl is described. She was Pequot Indian and she was 12 years old. On July 21st, 1786, she was babysitting six-year-old Eunice Bollis for a prominent white family. When the pair got into an argument over some strawberries. Just a few weeks prior to the killing, little Eunice had actually reported Hannah to her parents for stealing some fruit. On the day of the murder, Hannah confronted little Eunice and proceeded to beat her and strangle her to death. When questioned about the girl's death, she admitted killing her almost, almost immediately. Now, we don't know a great deal about Hannah's life before the murder took place, but what we do know paints a very sad picture about her life. Born March 1774, Hannah's life was over before it began, really. Her mother was an alcoholic who sent her young daughter off to work as a servant for a white family. However, Hannah seemed to have a bit of a temper that showed quite early on. At the age of Six, she beat up a white child while trying to steal a necklace. At her trial, the judge listed all of her vices, from theft to lying, and even remarked that all the local children were afraid of her. This is a 12-year-old girl. Now, we had mother being a drunk that pretty much gave her away and no father in her life Hannah was alone in the world nothing more than a child being forced to grow up too soon and in order to survive she never really stood a chance fair we might July 21st the body of young Eunice was found on the side of the road outside Norwich her body showed signs of severe trauma her head and body were mangled. <laughs> I'll watch it tomorrow. In fact, I might actually watch it in bed. Now, heavy, a number of heavy stones were also placed on her body, her arms and her legs. Now, Hannah was questioned and initially denied any knowledge of the murder and said that she had seen a group of boys on the road where the body was found earlier that day. Investigators, however, didn't believe her because, obviously, she had previous for violence. Um, so they took her to the house where the child's body lay, obviously awaiting burial. And upon further questioning, Hannah admitted what she had done. At her trial, 
In October 1786, Hannah appeared unconcerned with the events that were unfolding. However, as her execution date drew closer, she started displaying signs of fear. On 20th of December, Hannah Orkish, aged 12, was hanged by the neck until she was dead. Moments before sentence was carried out, she thanked the sheriff for his kindness. And on that day, Hannah Orkish became the youngest person to be executed in American history, and that is a record that still stands to this day. So, yeah, 12 years old, and she was hanged for murder. James Arsene was a 10-year-old Cherokee boy. Yeah, unfortunately, Care, tonight's tale does not get much better. Actually, I would say it gets worse. I'm kicking bottles galore. I'm sorry. I'm just... Uh. I'm a mess right now. My office is a mess right now. <coughs> Alright, so. James Arsene. A ten-year-old Cherokee boy. Now, we know absolutely nothing about his life before he committed murder. I've looked. I can't find anything, really, other than he was a ten-year-old Cherokee boy. He was involved in the robbery and murder of Swedish immigrant William Fiegel, along with a fellow Cherokee man, William Parchmill. Don't know his age, but it says man, so chances are he was older. Now, the two men followed their victim after he left the store and caught up with him two miles outside of Fort Gibson. I have absolutely no idea where that is. I'm not not gonna lie. But I'm not well versed in American geography, so yeah. So they caught up with him two miles outside of Fort Gibson. Where my page where my Pages proceed to stick together. There we go. I need got a clipboard. Well, they proceeded to shoot him six times and crush his skull with a rock. The two then robbed their victim's corpse and received a meagre 25 cents for their troubles. Thank you, baby. Hand is open. Oh, you are a diamond. Thank you. So, yeah. They robbed and killed a man for the equivalent of 25 cents. The pair were arrested, tried and sentenced to death. However, they escaped and managed to evade justice. But 13 years later... 23, now 23 year old James was apprehended and hanged by the neck until he was dead, making him the youngest person in American history to be sentenced to death. Now, though he was an adult when the sentence was carried out, when the sentence was passed, he was only 10 years old. So that got him into the gory history books. Again, a record that still stands. Now, the last person in this story. Some of you might know this story. 
Some of you will know it without even knowing you know it. There have been movies made about this story. Um, it's rumoured that parts of the Green Mile were based on this story. So even if you don't recognise the names, you might recognise the story. And remember at the beginning I said there was a twist? Here it is. And this one is a tearjerker. So if you're wearing mascara, I really, really hope it's waterproof. George Junius Stanny Junior. Born October 21st, 1829 was just 14 years old when he was executed by electric electrocution for the murder of two little white girls. I'm sus now I'm sus specifically there's that speech impediment mentioning the colour of the girls because like the other children in this story, George wasn't white either. He was a black boy from a poor family. Middle child of five, his father worked at local sawmill and the family lived in company accommodation. The area they lived was very segregated, with the town being split in two railway tracks, set up as though it was white side, black side. And because of this, racial interactions were very limited with each side of the tracks having their own schools and churches. Now, on the day of the double murder of 11-year-old Betty June Binnaker and 8-year-old Emma, no, sorry, Mary Emma Th Thames, two girls had been out picking wildflowers and riding in their bicycles when they disappeared. Just vanished. When the girls didn't return home when they were expected, various search parties were organised with hundreds of people volunteered to look for the little girls. Unfortunately, the body of the bodies of both girls were found the next day in a muddy ditch filled with water. Both girls suffered severe head wounds. Young George was arrested just a few hours later. I don't know, I couldn't see why they got to him. Maybe he just happened to be in the area at the time. I don't know. But he was arrested just a few hours after the little girl's bodies were found. And he was interrogated alone without his parents, without legal counsel, without witnesses, just him locked in a room alone with a bunch of white policemen. Within an hour, young George confessed to the crime of killing both girls. And according to his confession, he wanted to have sex with the older girl. Betty, but she was unwilling while her friend Mary was there. So, George decided to kill Mary. And when he went to kill little Mary, both girls fought back and George killed both of them with a 15-inch rail spike that was found nearby. Now, a few things about this case got me thinking. And George was small for his age. He was 14, right? A 14 year old boy. But he was a very small built 14 year old boy. He stood 5 foot 1 
and he was lucky if he weighed 90 pounds. So he was, for a boy of his age, small. And we are expected to believe that he was able to overpower and kill two little girls at the same time who could have run, they had their bicycles with them, they could have quite easily, the two of them, could have probably have overpowered this little lad because he it, it was tiny. So that, that didn't sit right with me. So obviously I did a wee bit more digging. Now, it was discovered that it wasn't the 15 inch wheel spike that killed the girls after all. It was a wooden beam that weighed at least 20 pounds. Now, little George, being the size he was, would not have been able to lift that, let alone wield it with enough force to bludgeon two little girls to death. It's a, it's a physical impossibility. That was a quarter of his body weight and we're expected to believe that he picked that up no problem and swung it several times in order to kill two girls who could have ran. But none of that actually mattered. And he was charged based purely on his confession. An angry mob formed being for the lad's blood. His father lost his job and his family lost, were, they were made homeless. But the worst was yet to come for George and his family. April 24th, 1944. Armed with only a court appointed lawyer who couldn't even be bothered to cross-examine witnesses. George was found guilty of two counts of first degree murder by a jury of all white people. Yeah. And that jury, a very white jury, took less than 10 minutes to decide that that little lad was guilty of a crime that he could not have physically committed. Yeah. Um, little George was then sentenced to death by electric chair. The morning of June 16th, 1944. Less than three months after the crime took place. George's sentence was carried out and he was pronounced dead four minutes later. Before executing him, the prison authorities asked him if he had any last words. To which he replied, no, sir. The prison doctor then questioned him. You don't want to say anything about what you did? Again, he replied, no, sir. Now, given George's size, the execution wasn't without problems. To give you an idea of just how small this little boy was, he needed a booster seat. type apparatus to fit into the chair to make him tall enough 
and the mask, the face mask that covers them, that covers their face, fell off mid-execution because it was just simply too big for them. But... Story of young George Jr. Stinney Jr. doesn't end there. His family fought tirelessly to clear his name. And then Yep. A lot of people know this story without knowing that they know it. It's, it's heartbreaking, but like I said, it's it's not a story that everybody knows that they know, but they know it through association, through something else. It's, it's heartbreaking, it really is. But in 2014, 70 years after the boy became the youngest person to be executed in the 20th century. Yeah. It really is. It makes you realise just how tiny this child was that they were executing. Horrible to think about. I mean, when you think about booster seats, you think putting them in the back of the car for, so that the kids can put the seatbelts on properly. You don't think a 14-year-old boy, a small bill 14-year-old boy needing one to be killed with an electric chair. It, it really is. It's, uh, it's horrible. But it was finally declared that he did not, in fact, receive a fair trial. Well, no shit. And that it was impossible for him to lift the beam that killed the girls, let alone swing it with enough force to kill them. Well, duh. George was finally proved innocent of the crimes he had been executed for. And all because his family just refused to stop fighting to prove what they already knew. Because George was gone, but he still had a mother, a father, two brothers and two sisters who continued the fight. And then their children, who would have been George's niece and nephews, continued the fight and it went on for generations and they continued to fight and fight and fight until finally 70 years later the courts turn around and says you, you don't hold up this doesn't make sense how could he have done that he didn't do this so yeah 70 years later after he was found guilty and executed, he was cleared. So, there we have it. Three centuries, three murders, three executions, where children were sentenced to death by a court of law and a jury of their peers. Hmm. However, in 2005, now please listen to this next sentence and let this sink in. 2005, 17 years ago, just only. The United States Supreme Court abolished 
the death penalty for criminals who committed their crimes as juveniles under the age of 15. 2005 it took them till to realise that executing children was wrong. Why? Why did it take so long? Why the hell did it take them to 2005 to stop and think, hold on, should we really be executing children? They were still executing children up until 2005. What? No. Just no. Now, since 1973, that's not that long ago. 49 years ago. It was 11 years before I was born. It was easy enough to work out. But 49 years ago, since then, in the last, well, between then and 2005, Two hundred and twenty six juveniles. Juveniles being defined as anyone under the legal age of fifteen. So fifteen and under is a juvenile in this instance. Two hundred and twenty six juveniles have received the death penalty between 1973 and 2005. 21 of those, 21, have been executed. And a further 80 still remain in death row. They must have already been on death row before the law changed in 2005. So why? Now, this is just me spitballing. Why, when the law was changed to abolish the death penalty for juveniles under the age of 15, why were these 80 people, 80 children, why were their convictions not, not quashed, no, changed? Why were their sentences not changed? From the death penalty to life without parole or X amount of years, whatever. I, I don't know the answer. It's these 226 children because that's what they are. They are defined by law as juveniles, but they are children. 226. Now, I know the numbers don't add up. I don't know what happened to the rest. 21 of those have been executed and 80 still remain in death row. So that's 101 out of 226. So what the hell happened to the other 125 children that were sentenced to death between 1973 and 2005? Maybe they had their appeals granted, their convictions quashed. I don't know. Okay, that's 125 children who... They haven't been executed. And they're not still on death row. So why are those 80 children still on death row? They shouldn't be. I mean, obviously, if they were convicted before 2005, they're no longer children, but they were at the time when they were sentenced. They were children. Now, like I said, 
and I've said it time and time again and I will continue to say it. I am a firm believer in the death penalty under the right circumstances. I'm all for it. None of tonight's stories, none of those children were the right circumstances. Not one of them should have received the death penalty. Hannah Orkish. She beat and strangled a six-year-old girl to death over strawberries. She had a very troubled past. She had violent tendencies. She lied. She stole. She was feared. Yes, she should have been locked up. But she should not have been executed. She was 12 years old. Her mother didn't want her. Her father wasn't in the scene. She should have a, She should have been institutionalised. But she shouldn't have been hanged. A child. No. No. She needed help and she was let down. But, sorry, I'm going to grab a cigarette. As we've seen, both with Scotland, the Graves and with Storytime with Buck Buck, the system lets people down a lot. The system is broken, it is corrupt. And people like Hannah, who even back then, needed help she never got it rather than help her they put a rope around her neck and hung her because it was easier than institutionalising her and trying to make her better she might never have got better she might have stayed she might have spent the remainder of her life in institutions and asylums and in out of correction facilities we don't know <coughs> thanks for the attempt there Wraith but it doesn't really work when I'm looking at my screen because it comes up right there in front of me nice attempt though try again on Tuesday Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, for this stream, I look straight at it. You, you will get me on a Tuesday and a Thursday. Especially on a Thursday when I'm playing Resident Evil. Everybody gets me in that and I've got so many clips. I actually need to go through and download and upload and... Oh, what day is tomorrow? Tomorrow's... I'll date on Monday. I'll date tomorrow. Tomorrow's Monday. I'll date then. But... Aye, so that was Vihana. Right. She needed help. She needed institutionalised. Like I said, she might never have got out. But at least she wouldn't have been a danger to anybody and she would not have been hung age 12. You want to go down in history as doing something, then fine. But don't go down in history as being the youngest person to be executed in the country. No. No. Now, James Arsene. He, this is a tricky one because we don't know that much about him. But what he did was wrong, right? But he was 10. We don't know what, if any, relation the other Cherokee man was to him. Um... We don't know if he was led astray, if he was told this is what you need to do. We don't know because we don't know anything about him. Should he have been punished for his crimes? Most definitely. And the fact that he was able to escape custody at the age of 10 and go on the run for 13 years? Hmm. But I still don't believe that a 10-year-old should have been sentenced to death. 
even though it was a brutal robbery and murder. Or murder then robbery, whatever way you want to look at it. But I personally do not believe that he should have been hung. He, sh he should not have been sentenced to death. Now, had he went on the run before he was sentenced and then was sentenced to death at age 23, right, okay, I can maybe understand that. Because he did take part in it. Like I said, we don't know the specifics. But he was involved in the robbery and murder of a man. So, had he went on the run before sentencing, got caught age 23 and then sentenced to death, yeah, maybe I could get behind that. But he was sentenced to death at the age of 10. That I can't get behind. No wonder the kid ran. Anybody would run given the chance. Well, you've got two options. You can either stay and get hanged, or you can attempt to run. We might kill you while you're making your escape, but you might get away. We might catch you later on, but you're not going to hang straight away. Yeah, I get why you ran. I, I totally get it. And he should never have been sentenced to death as a 10-year-old. Not a chance. Nope. And then... Then we've got poor George. George Junius Stinney Jr. That little boy should never have seen the inside of a police cell. He should never have seen the inside of a courtroom. And he sure as shit should never have been sitting on an electric chair for a crime he never committed. That he wasn't physically capable of of committing. That lad was let down. No two ways about it. They wanted a quick conviction. They wanted someone to pin the blame on for the death of these two little white girls. And this little black boy happened to be the scapegoat. It was nothing more than racially motivated. He was black, they were white, he was getting sentenced to death for it. They didn't care about evidence, they didn't care about anything. I mean, his own fucking lawyer didn't care about him. And if it wasn't for the tireless efforts of his family, who continued long after... For generations, he would still, to this day, be believed to have killed those little girls. And it is absolutely disgusting what happened to that boy. Now, I've seen pictures of that little boy, that tiny little child strapped into that electric chair. And that should never have been allowed to harm. And another sad part about that case, the real killer, the twisted son of a bitch, graphics card. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. I'm... Tonight I am talking about children who were sentenced to death for murder. For committing murders. Two of the children did commit the murders. There's no, no doubt about that. 
The third, however, was innocent, but was sentenced to death and was only proved innocent 70 years after he had been executed for a crime that he wasn't physically capable of committing. So, yeah. But, like I said, I mean, whoever did kill little Betty and little Mary, we know it wasn't George. They got away with it. So, it makes you think. It makes you think a couple of things. Did the police know who the real killer was? Was uh, maybe a, a prominent white person? Because they were hell-bent and pinning it in this little black boy. So maybe they knew who it was. And it was a cover-up. Maybe they had no idea. And they didn't, didn't want to seem incompetent. They wanted it solved. So they coerced a naive, scared little boy into confessing to something that he... Science has proven he was not physically capable of doing. But... The family of little George kept fighting. Um, George was executed on, in 1944 and in 2014 his distant family were finally able to prove his innocence. Or they, were, they always knew he was innocent. But they were finally able to clear his name and to prove once and for all that he never did it. So, 70 years. Um, so, yeah, but whoever killed those little girls, whoever really killed those little girls, now, if you remember, I said that um, some people say that the Green Mile is loosely ties in. If you remember, um, John Coffey, the character of him, he's accused of killing the two little white girls when in fact it was the crazy white guy. That's where it's kind of based on Narcissus, that's where some of the inspiration came from. Because even back then, when that was written, when Stephen King wrote that, even back then, everybody knew that this little boy did not kill those little girls. Because he couldn't. He weighed 90 pounds soaking wet and was 5 foot 1. He was smaller than me. And I'm tiny. I need to use a step ladder to reach the middle shelf in the kitchen, never mind the top shelf. And he was smaller than me. So everybody knew, but it, it took 70 years to actually legally clear his name. So the real killer got away with it. And a family was destroyed. I mean, unemployed, homeless, they lost everything. All because the police were either completely incompetent or were covering up for something. But, yeah. So, I, I, did, I did warn you last week that this story wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be a pleasant one. It really does wreak a cover up. 
It really does. But I've been doing fucking the case is long gone. They're long dead. And if it wasn't for the family continuing the fight, the the truth would have been long buried. But they kept fighting. But we're never going to know. I know. I mean, she's older than the second boy in tonight's story, James. He was only 10 when he was sentenced to death. And, like I said, it was 2005 before they finally thought, you know what, we really need to stop executing fucking children. That really isn't a good look for us. We should stop executing children. 2005? Just, what? Why, why did it take so long for them to stop and think? Okay, that one got me. I was looking right at the screen, but the music started a split second before it came up. But, yeah, why did it take them so long to stop and think, why, why, why are we... Oh, I just... Uh, why? Why does it take them so long to stop and think, you know, maybe we shouldn't be killing children. Maybe, just maybe we should get them help instead of just executing them. And the fact that there are still 80 juveniles. Well, no. There are still 80 people on death row who were sentenced to death as juveniles. Their sentences should have been changed and they should have been taken off a of death row. In my opinion. Because what I read out on the paper, that's fact. Unless I say it's my opinion, then it's fact. It's been researched, it's been checked and double checked and it's all from reputable sources. When the paper's done, the words that are coming out of my mouth, my opinion, okay? Just wanted to clarify that. But as I've always stated, I do believe that in the right circumstances, the death penalty should be used. Like, Richard Cottenham, the Manhattan Ripper, last week, he should have been sentenced to death. There's no two ways about that. In my opinion, he should have been sitting on that electric chair back in the 80s. As it stands, he's still in jail in New Jersey. That, that's not right. Executing children is never right. Children should not, under any circumstances, be sentenced to death. And the fact that it took the Supreme Court till 2005 to realise that, yeah, that sh that shit's messed up, bro. Like, really messed up. And trust me, we've covered some messed up shit in this channel. Just sitting here chewing the fat. We have covered some pretty messed up stuff. We've covered the Manhattan rapper. We've covered. Sony Beanie Babies in the caves with the inbred cannibal family and... Oh. We covered Christy the Cleek dying an old man with his beautiful wife and kids after killing dozens of people and eating. Killing and eating. We've covered 
so many things, but and for the majority of them, the ones that were hanged, or they deserved it. The Sonny Bean family, they deserved to be hung. The men, the women were born at the stake, but you know what I mean. But there's sometimes you think, here, hold up, no. I mean, the woman that, in Aberdeen that killed the little girl and just because she had beef with the family and got out ten years later, sentenced to death, but that got quashed the next day because, you know, friends in high places kind of thing. And then ten years later, the husband that had left her suddenly ends up with cancer and oh, it's okay, you're reformed, don't you go and look after your dying husband that you don't give a damn about because you bludgeoned an eight-year-old girl to death and got your eight-year-old daughter to help cover it up. I'll wait and play housewife now. It's okay, you, you just don't kill any more kids. But then that's messed up, okay? The... And then you've got the... The adopting the babies and killing them for money where the woman was hung. But the man got away with it because he knew nothing about it. Even though the babies were found on a cupboard that she couldn't get to. In his jacket. But he knew nothing about it. He walked away. And then you've got Birkin here. Yeah, that was a fun one. One got killed and one ran away. Go away, on you go. Take to the borders and go away. We, we don't need England. We don't care about you now. But, so there's been a few instances where you think, oh, no, that's not right. But executing kids is never right. Yes, two out of the three of tonight's children committed Horrible crimes. And they should have been punished. There is no doubt in my mind that they should have been punished for those crimes that they committed. But they shouldn't have been sentenced to death for them. But, hit me up. What do you think? Well, do you stand on it? Because obviously, the death penalty is. Sorry, I'm at a tip cigarette, so it's going to take me about 20 minutes to smoke one now. But the death penalty is a touchy subject. It's like a few other subjects that you either go one way or the other. And then you get the ones up in the middle. Like, oh, I'm not really too sure. Me, I'm a firm believer in it. If the circumstances are right. I mean, it's a narrow, narrow list of what you need to do for the circumstances to be right to get the death sentence, in my opinion. But there are definitely a few instances where the death penalty should be applied. And then what we've learned, that's not always the case. Um, uh, so, let me know what you think. But, I have been given some ideas. Now, obviously... I did say last week, I did warn you that right, see, it's a very valid opinion. It's like you can see both sides. It's like, yeah, these monsters should be dead, but should anybody really be given that 
authority to make that decision. Oh, yeah. I mean, like I said, just because some people are allowed to make a decision doesn't always necessarily mean that they are allowed, they, they should be allowed to make it. You know? It's, it, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, obviously what I'm about to say is a bit of an extreme, but what happens if you get somebody in court, he's been accused of murder, right? The horrible crimes, right? It's not 100% that he committed that. But the jury think he looks dodgy. Or he's got a a dodgy track record, you know, maybe stole a few cars or wrote a couple of dodgy checks or it's just, it's, it's no squeaky clean. And they decide to find him guilty. What happens if the judge decides I don't like the look of your shoes. Fuck it, black hammer, you're going to the gallows. No one person should have that authority. I agree with you there. That's not to say I don't agree with the death penalty in certain circumstances, but it should not be one person that decides. It's one of those things that we're never going to get right. Not everybody's always going to agree on it. And it's... It's a double-edged sword. Because even now, with the forensics breakthroughs that we've got, with the scientific knowledge and with everything that we can do, Exactly. That's why I specifically chose those three children. None, none of those children were white, but all of the victims were white. And all of the juries were white. Would they have been sentenced to death if they were white children? No. Would they even have seen a courtroom? had they been white children? Probably not. Nobody cared. But luckily... Not luckily for we George, because it, it didn't end well for him, unfortunately. But somebody cared. His family cared for him, at least. So they kept fighting. But had they been white children, they would it would never have happened. Even if they had been caught red-handed, the chances are it, they wouldn't have been sentenced to death. And that is why I specifically chose those three cases. Because it was blatant racism that caused the death of three children. It was three non-white children that were, that were accused of committing crimes against white individuals. The first one was a white child and the last two were white children. The Swedish immigrant was, he was an adult but he was also white. And it's not the first time that my stories have went down that road. It's, I mean, look at me, I'm white, okay? So I, ca I can't, I can't say that I've experienced anything like that because I haven't. But I know that that does happen because I'm not a fucking idiot, okay? And... I know that shit like that still happens, even now. It shouldn't, 
but it does and I think for Pope with the the George Stinney case particularly was that once the kid was dead nobody would care it would be swept under the rug and forgotten about but obviously his family had other ideas and they were not letting that rest they were not letting that kid die while being accused of killing two little white girls and I'm going to keep emphasising the colour of the victims because uh, had the victims been a different colour had it been two little black girls then it, it wouldn't have got as much attention and I dare say no one would have been electrocuted for it But again, that's my personal opinion. Right? Like I said, if I'm holding the paper, what I'm reading is facts. When the paper's done, it's my opinion. And these cases, unfortunately, what well, we're never going to know for certain. But we can say with a degree of certainty. Had the colours been reversed it would have been a completely different outcome and it's heartbreaking to think that it took 70 years for that little boy to get justice and I mean I I can I can remember when it came out in 2014 that he never done it that it was finally proved and accepted by court of law that he was in fact innocent and I remember it and I remember at the time seeing the pictures of this little tiny little boy with a shaven head sitting on a fucking booster seat in the electric chair and thinking this isn't right that shit should not have happened and then doing the extra research lately and it's just it's made me think no you know that no just looking at those pictures it's just I mean I warned people a fortnight ago when I was doing the Whitechapel murders uh, the Whitechapel docket that there are pictures online of the last Jack the Ripper victim and they are actual photographs and they are very graphic in detail. Um, look at them at your own risk. I remember making that warning. And I'm making the same warning now. now there's nothing graphic. There's nothing gory in the pictures online of little George. But it's heartbreaking to what to see. It's a fucking child strapped in an electric chair about to die for something he physically couldn't have done. I mean, fuck, I probably couldn't do it. Ten years ago, yeah, probably I could have swung 20 pound about without thinking twice, but that's beside the point. I couldn't do that. So why would they believe that a 14-year-old smaller than average 14 year old boy would do that I mean he was tiny I mean even an average sized child at that age would have struggled but I don't know it just history it's hindsight is always 2020 okay you look back and you see things the way they should be and unfortunately they're not and all we can do is we can learn take forward what we know what we've learned from history and make sure we don't repeat the same mistakes and yes it might have taken them to 
2005 to abolish the death penalty for juveniles. But at least they've done it. The one thing though that I couldn't I couldn't find was information on race of how many juveniles between 1973 and like out of the 226 juveniles that were sentenced to death from 1973 I couldn't find race ethnic ethnicity oh, sorry I do have a speech impediment and I do keep saying that because I mean I found one website that I thought this is great this is going to get me extra information that I need and then I realised that they wanted me to pay a subscription fee to look at one page and I thought well you ain't going to give me the information that I need so yeah there's that but yeah so not a happy story tonight I'm afraid not a happy ending there never is when there's children involved let's let's be real if I'm talking about children it ain't ending well story time with buck box never never good happy feel good stories okay I ain't no woke fucking Disney. But these stories, doing the research, that it is quite dark. And I did say last week that I was going to start working on rotation. So I'm going to do three on and one off. So I did the Whitechapel docket, which included the the Jack the Ripper murders and which then led me to last week's story which started off as the Thames Torso Killer which then migrated to the Manhattan Ripper also known as the Times Square Torso Killer Richard Cottenham uh, and then this week has been about grave miscarriages of justice for children um, so next week, um, there's not going to be a dark story. There is a story, but it's more of a, an information. And a lot of my er earlier stories, we, we kept coming across the same pathologist. Dr. Glacia, Dr. Glacia, Dr. Glacia, and he kept popping up each week. And I've been doing these stories all year now. I started them at the beginning of January. And every week. No, I'm, I'm just going to take a break for the dark side of things. It's just going to be a fluff piece. But the name Philip Glacia. Doctor Philip Glacier keeps popping up and keeps popping up and keeps popping up and all these earlier stories that I did and it turns out he led quite the interesting life so next week is going to be a, a filler episode so to speak it's going to be a bit more light hearted now, I know a few weeks ago I did the light hearted tale with the 30 year old man that pretended to be a teenager again to go back to school to try and be a doctor. So every, and again, every fourth story is going to be a light hearted piece like that because the other three weeks are pretty dark and twisted and I love the macabre. I really do. I love all things. I've now just realised all you can see there is the big twitch symbol but I love everything dark and macabre and gothic and but it does take its toll on you and it does get you thinking 
Alright, no, this is kind of dark, even for me, my tastes. So, every fourth week, I'm going to do a, a light-hearted story. Like, like the guy that pretended to be a teenager again to go back to high school. He's old high school. To try again to become a doctor. I kind of feel bad for him. I still really want to watch that movie. Uh, and then next week I'm going to do the Dr. Glacier story. And then I've got... One, two... So I've got a story the minimum. I believe it was you that put me on the Albert Fish. Dang. Yeah, I knew. I knew about Albert Fish, but Dang. So I'm working on that, which is a lot easier now that little miss HP in the corner there's working again. So I'm working on the Albert Fish thing, and then my mother-in-law actually put me onto a story, a local story, quite recent in fact, relatively recent for what I can figure out. So I'm, I'm still trying to dig through the facts for the faction on both of those. So next week will be Dr. Glacier, which will be a light, light, light piece. Yeah, it's more of an expose type thing, I don't know. So, I mean, I still, I'm going to market it as an 18 plus, purely because of some of the work that he did. It, I mean, he was a pathologist, okay, it's not exactly a pleasant job, you know? So... I'm going to do that as my lighter piece. Then I'm going to do Albert Fish. Because I really, really want to do the Albert Fish story. And then I'm going to go and do the local story. Um, just need to get some more information about that. And then I'm... that look into that because a lot of it is so dark and twisted and wow it's like really and of course I have got a, a few other big stories that I'm working on but I'm wanting to save them for very specific dates so you need to bear with me on that one so I'm still looking to ideas like I said, I've got the Albert Fish, I've got the local story that I don't want to talk too much about because I'm still trying to sift through the information on that. Yeah. Yeah. But I have got a couple of those that I might work on, but... I'm looking for, I'm still looking for ideas, okay, whether it's a local myth or legend or like Sonny Bean is to us down here, he's local, that's just kind of messed up, and Chrissy the Cleek was local to my brother-in-law. That's where that tale started. Um, we've got the Birkin hair, which means a lot personally to me because I, I used to bounce in the venues where they would take the bodies through. Seriously though, if you're ever in Edinburgh, go to the caves on Nidri. Great night. Supernatural stories, yes I do. I've actually did a couple of local haunted castles uh, recently. I did, um, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but I did Killeen Castle and I did Drumlanrig Castle. Um, Killeen Castle is haunted, 
but it's also got a rather murky past about the slave trade and Drumlanwood Castle has got a few interesting ghosts. There's the Headless Lady in White and the Little Yellow Monkey. And I'm not joking about that. I, sw I swear, as crazy as that sounds, Drumlanwood Castle has got the ghost of a Yellow Monkey. Yeah, if you check them out on YouTube, but yes, I do cover Supernatural when I get a story, I think. Like the Yellow Monkey, it's one that me and my sister, um, Angel, in the chat, um, we grew up hearing because we visited the castle and it was one that I, I wanted to look into. So I, I do do Supernatural um, and I'm quite happy to do, do things like that. As long as it's no just all genie down the road said she saw a cat that wasn't really a cat that that kind of thing and, you know as long as it's substantiated if that makes sense but yeah the, i'm pretty much open to doing anything that's anti fairy tale if that makes sense i don't do happy endings that makes me sound like something else. Right, no. <laughs> I'm not a Disney storyteller. Right, it's no happy ever after. But gore, murder, horror, haunting. Yeah, I'm up for doing it. And the more obscure, the better. To the point... But I'm actually still working on something that me and my dad started years ago. Of a random thing that he saw in his sat nav that isn't there. But it is there, but it's not there, and it's the weirdest thing, and I'm still working on that. And I, I, I actually think that it's. Maybe no supernatural, but maybe me and demonic cult, I'm thinking. At least that's where my road the inquiry's taking me in that one. It's, it's a weird one. But yeah, I'm pretty much open to doing anything. But if you've got ideas, you can get me on here, you can get me on Twitter, you can get me on TikTok, you can get me on Hover, you can get me on... Where else can you, you can get me on Instagram? Um... If you know me personally, you can get me on Facebook, uh, you can get me on Discord, uh, and the Ginger Army, and just, yeah, I mean, this one's been a long time in the making, and I'm still trying to get to the bottom of it, and it is fucking driving me insane, because I know it's there, I just happen to, I just, I need to get there to see what it is. And public transport in that area is non-existent. And I don't drive. But. I'll get it sorted. Thank you very much. Master Mod Man. There's Discord. Link and chat. I've got my own segment in there. So if you've got any ideas. Drop them in there. But, I'm going to call it a night. But, like I said, I'll be back next week with a, a filler piece on Dr. Glacier. Just to lighten the mood a wee bit. Because the last three stories have been pretty... We'll go with horrific. Horrific sounds like a good enough word. If not tough shit. Uh, I'm on the bus, yeah, I don't even care. Horrific's close enough. So, next week, fluff piece. Then we're going straight in with the big boy. We're going straight after Albert Fish. And then we've got the local story, which is pretty effed up, if you ask me. And I know effed up, so if I'm saying it's effed up, then it's effed up. And then I'm at the ideas. So, yeah, hit me up, 
let me know what you think. But I'm going to leave it there for tonight. And um, we're going to go catch tonight's Doctor Who, actually, I think. Since I was here and didn't see it. But BBC iPlayer. Just don't tell them. <laughs> but I will find out today that's interesting. Night Kiddo, Night Minimum, uh, thank you very much, I'm glad you enjoyed. But I will be back on Tuesday as normal with some Fortnite, definitely with Ginger Mini, possibly with others, haven't quite discovered that yet. Then I will be back on, let me count it, out, Thursday night with the next instalment of the original Resident Evil. Where we will try and find the final death mask and the final fucking key. And let's not try and die within the first five minutes of the game this time. But, until next time, take care of each other, stay safe, and bye bye now.